Hi, my name is Trisha Hugelay, and I am Chief of Pediatric Gynecology at Children's Hospital Colorado, and I want to talk to you today about heavy menstrual bleeding and iron deficiency in teens, recognizing this actually quite common problem and how to think about working it up. So heavy menstrual bleeding is common in teens with anywhere from 15 to 40 percent of teens perceiving their bleeding as abnormally heavy. And although menstruation in adolescents certainly can be irregular very commonly because of anovulation from an immature hypothalamic pituitary axis, cycles still typically occur anywhere from every 21 to 45 days, occasionally with a skip cycle, and last generally seven days or less. It can be hard to define heavy menstrual bleeding, and because of that, we actually now in the literature define heavy menstrual bleeding as excessive menstrual blood loss that interferes with a patient's physical, social, emotional, or, mat or material quality of life, and it can occur alone, or it can definitely be associated with other symptoms like fatigue, shortness of breath, um, and so on. And historically in the literature, we define heavy menstrual bleeding as blood loss that is 80 cc's or greater in volume, which of course is nearly impossible for patients or providers to quantify. So it's important that we have other parameters to look at. So when we talk about normal menstrual flow, generally, as I mentioned, it typically occurs in teens anywhere from every 21 to 45 days and generally lasts seven days or less and heavy menstrual flow is different. Generally with heavy menstrual flow, you're seeing more frequent bleeding, cycles that are occurring more frequently than every 21 days, bleeding that's prolonged, lasting more than seven days in duration. If patients are reporting passing menstrual clots, you generally at the size of a one inch diameter quarter or larger, that's concerning. Certainly if they're soaking pads or tampons every one to two hours or more frequently, and also if they're having frequent flooding accidents into their clothes or bed sheets, that's a, certainly a red flag that they're having too much bleeding. When it comes to the causes of heavy menstrual bleeding, there are quite a number of diagnoses to think about. Um, and in gynecology, we usually use the PALM-COHEN acronym to approach it, with PALM representing the structural causes for abnormal bleeding and COHEN representing the non-structural causes. And in teens, for the vast majority of patients, they don't have a structural cause, which is why we don't recommend a pelvic ultrasound or other imaging for initial evaluation. The vast majority of adolescents with heavy menstrual bleeding fall into the Cohen, and really there, we're talking about two possibilities. The majority having ov ovulatory dysfunction as well as potentially an inherited bleeding disorder. So ovulatory dysfunction by far is the most common with upwards of 80% of patients with heavy menstrual bleeding just having ovulatory dysfunction. In the first year after menarche, upwards of 85% of teens will have anovulatory cycles. This results in this unopposed estrogen proliferation of the menstrual cycle, vasodilation of the blood vessels. They're not getting the ovulation and the progestin that's so important to prevent the excessive prol proliferation to allow for the vasoconstriction, and so they have vasodilation and bleeding of these largely proliferated linings that results in pretty significant blood loss pretty quickly. And so this is really common in teens. But it's also important to know that 20% of patients presenting with heavy menstrual bleeding, 20% of teens, will have an inherited bleeding disorder. And if we look at the general population, the overall frequency of an inherited bleeding disorder is about 1 to 2 percent. But bleeding disorders are often discovered in teens because the menstrual cycle becomes their first real challenge, and upwards of 20 to 30 percent of patients who are actually hospitalized for heavy menstrual bleeding in adolescents will be diagnosed with a bleeding disorder. So when you're evaluating patients and their menstrual cycle, these menstrual bleeding red flags are key. You know, is their cycle regular or is it irregular, which suggests an anovulatory pattern and potentially a real risk for heavy bleeding. If their bleeding is lasting greater than seven days, they're passing large clots, they're frequently changing their pads and tampons, and they're frequently having flooding accidents, that's a significant warning for heavy menstrual bleeding. If they screen positive there, then you definitely need to think, well, there's a 20 to 30 percent risk that they could have an inherited bleeding disorder, and then you want to probe for the non-menstrual bleeding questions. 
do they have nosebleeds and are they taking a long time to stop? Generally, we use the parameter of 10 minutes. Certainly, if they've had to go to urgent care because of a nosebleed to get it to stop, that's very concerning. Um, do they have minor cuts and wounds that take a long time to stop? Have they had surgery? If they haven't had surgery, which many teens have not, have they had a tooth extraction that resulted in excessive bleeding? Another important question is, is there a family history of iron deficiency? Many uh, family members have unrecognized bleeding disorders. In fact, the average time to diagnosis for a woman with an inherited bleeding disorder is 16 years. So it's really important they're not just asking, is there a family history of a bleeding disorder, but is there just a family history of iron deficiency? Because of course that's not normal. And then certainly other bleeding questions in the family, is there a family history of heavy menstrual bleeding, bleeding after uh, pregnancy delivery? And so once you do those initial screening questions, if that patient screens positive for heavy bleeding, you want to do a laboratory workup. At the very least, you want to get a CBC and a ferritin, and we'll talk about why that's so important. You, of course, want to get a pregnancy test. And then in patients who are one to two years after menarche, who are showing signs of irregular menstrual cycles, you want to initiate that anovulatory workup. Rule them out for thyroid disease. Assess them for ovarian insufficiency with an FSH, check a prolactin level, and then finally think about PCOS with a total and free testosterone. And in those patients who screen positive for heavy menstrual bleeding, especially if they also have a low ferritin or they have any of those non-menstrual question red flags positive, then you want to definitely think about screening them for an inherited bleeding disorder. And in terms of the sort of initial testing we recommend for that, we recommend a Von Willebrand's panel, since it is the most common cause of an inherited bleeding disorder, with checking a Von Willebrand antigen, checking its activity, and then also checking a factor VIII assay, since it impacts Von Willebrand function. And then you also want to get your general bleeding times with a PTT, a PT, and a thrombin time. And so why is it important to check a ferritin? So it's really critical to check a ferritin because in patients who are having heavy menstrual bleeding, the very first thing that's going to happen is their ferritin is gonna drop. They're essentially gonna run out of their iron stores. Once that occurs, then they sort of enter into this phase of iron-restricted erythropoiesis where they can't generate new red cells, and then you start to see changes in the CBC and the red cell indices, and you'll start to see a drop in the mean corpuscular volume. And it's not until all of that has happened that then finally the hemoglobin drops. So if you're just checking a CBC or you're just checking a point-of-care hemoglobin in your office, you're gonna miss a lot of these teens or are having such heavy bleeding that it's resulting in iron deficiency. And this is just another highlight of this. This is a really nice study that was done at Nationwide that looked at almost 120 teens who were presenting outpatient care reporting heavy menstrual bleeding. And what they found is that almost half of their patients had low ferritins, yet their red cell indices were normal. So they would have missed almost half their patients with iron deficiency that needed treatment if they hadn't drawn a, a ferritin level. And of course, iron deficiency is important for our teens. It causes a multitude of symptoms, including extreme fatigue, headaches, dizziness. Uh, they often will crave ice or other non-edible food items, which is, of course, not good for their nutrition. It can affect their mood, causing depression, anxiety, and a multitude of symptoms that we really want to be able to treat. And it also impacts their cognition. This was also a really nice study done a while ago that looked at almost 720 teens who were enrolled in various high schools and screening them for iron deficiency without anemia. And what they found is that there were about 100 girls who were not anemic iron deficient. And they randomized the group to half receiving iron repletion and half receiving placebo. And then they basically had them take a series of cognitive tests. And what they found is that those girls who had their iron repleted performed significantly better on the verbal and mental reasoning scores than their cohorts who did not have iron repletion. So when we approach oral iron, um, it really depends upon the level of anemia and iron deficiency. Certainly for those patients who are severely anemic and iron deficient, we want to give them a high dose of ferrous sulfate, 130 milligrams, but just once daily because you get better absorption when you don't split the dosing. For the patients that are only mildly anemic, 
uh, a single tablet of 65 milligrams of elemental iron is enough. And then for the largest group of our patients that are iron deficient but not necessarily anemic, the ideal dosing is actually one tablet every other day. And we continue this for a minimum of three months and then repeat their ferritin levels. And so to summarize, I hope you understand and recognize you know, how important heavy menstrual bleeding screening is for our teens. It's quite common. It's a third, if not more, of our teens are having heavy menstrual bleeding and often iron deficiency, if not more. And many of these teens, this will be their first warning sign that there's an, actually an underlying inherited bleeding disorder. Um, for more information on this topic, uh, you can go to our website, Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology.